Draymond Green just can't help himself. A women's basketball championship without the Lady Huskies? Will this be a year for an NBA co-MVP? And stick around to hear who's on the bench this week. Welcome to this week's edition of What's the 401 Sports. I'm Keisha Wilson. I'm Mike McDonald. Mike, good to see you as always. How are you? I'm doing well, Keisha. And you? I'm doing well. And how about you guys? You good? Perfect. So before we get on to our March Madness update, we need to mention that former Dallas Cowboys quarterback Tony Romo is hanging up his cleats for good, and he's making his way into the broadcasting booth at CBS. And Charlotte Hornets assistant coach Patrick Ewing will take the head coaching job at his alma mater, Georgetown University, heading up the men's basketball program. So good luck to both of you. And now... We'll go on to our March Madness, and we're going to start with the women and the women's basketball tournament and the 2017 NCAA Women's Basketball Champions are the South Carolina Gamecocks. You heard that right. South Carolina, led by head coach Don Staley, who is a Hall of Famer and three-time Olympian, captured their first ever women's NCAA basketball championship by beating Mississippi State 67 to 55. Now, to get to the final game, Mississippi State beat powerhouse UConn in a move that nobody really expected. It was, you know, UConn was almost everybody's pick to win the whole tournament. But the interesting thing is, is that there weren't a lot of viewers in terms of watching the women's tournament until the Final Four, when UConn started to lose to Mississippi State. Now, Mike, you know, we see in some women's sports, like women's soccer, the U.S. national team, and in UFC, where actually, you know, sometimes you do pay to watch these fights, there seems to be more of an interest. But when it came to the women's Final Four, there wasn't a lot of interest until it became a trending topic that UConn was losing to Mississippi State. Tell me your thoughts. I think for one point, People are just looking at women's basketball as it's not as exciting as the men. And they tune out. They don't they aren't interested. Unless, of course, the Yukon Huskies are playing. And as you pointed out, Keisha, there were some people keeping tabs on that game. They're looking at their smartphones. They see that the score is close. They see that Yukon is losing. So then that they start to go ahead and tune in. I think one way that women's college basketball has hurt itself is from a marketing standpoint. I think that there's a specific age group between or people between the ages of 18 to maybe 30, 35 years old that they need to to target people in their 40s, 40s and 50s, specifically men, men in their 50s and 60s, a lot of them have, I hate to say it, but a sexist point of view. I don't care about the women because it's not as exciting. And that said, and as you point out, we've talked about this many times, people will watch Ronda Rousey beat the crap out of another girl or have the girl beat the crap out of her, and you'll get millions and millions of people to see this. But when you have the Women's College Basketball Final Four, which is an exciting time, people tune it out. And that's a sad state of affairs. Yeah, I mean, I think there are a couple of things at play here. One, I think we are in a a society where our attention spans aren't very long. And with, especially with UFC, the the rounds are shorter and they're, you know, you're about three to five rounds at two to three minutes apiece. So you don't have to invest a lot of time in watching a match. And unfortunately, I think UConn is a victim of their own successes. And I think it, I liken it to what some people call the Patriot fatigue, where you see the same team winning all the time and, and with the UConn women in a pretty dominant fashion. They haven't lost, you know, this was their first loss since 2014. That was almost two years ago. Do you know what's happened in two years? I still... I had to now check a different age box on forums, you know, from two years ago. So, you know, a lot of things would happen, I think. So there's just fatigue. It's like, oh, the women are going to, you know, UConn's going to win. Let's just pencil it in and call it a day. Because nobody, thus far, has has really competed with them on a a level. So um, when they started to lose and it was trending, it was like, oh, okay, well, let's see. Because I think for the past couple years, it was always... Who is going to be the one to beat UConn? And I think the same with Ronda Rousey. I know that I would tune in to see how long or how quickly her match would be, just as much as I wanted to see who was going to be the one. Was this going to be the day that Ronda Rousey was going to lose? So I think that's probably the same with UConn.
Well, Keisha, we go to men's college basketball, and I ask you, as a Duke fan, what was your take on the North Carolina Tar Heels capturing the men's basketball championship, beating Gonzaga? Well, you know, I wanted to vomit. I mean, you just know, I just don't. <laughs> as a Duke fan who just bleeds Duke blue, I never, ever, 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 ever want Carolina to succeed, ever. I revert back to my ABCs, anybody but Carolina. But the game itself, Mike, I was disappointed. It was one of the worst championship games I've seen between the officiating and just the real lack of offense, of offensive efficiency in the game. Um... It was tough, and I think that Gonzaga got a little, got a little screwed a little on a couple of calls. But you know, you, you can't blame it all on the refs. You still have to execute. So I didn't like it. I do not wish happiness on Carolina. <laughs> I thought horrible execution by Gonzaga and their coaching staff in terms of you got to get it to the big man. You should have been pounding it to him throughout the whole game, as you pointed out. Sloppy, sloppy game. A lot of missed free throws. Both teams just look out of sync. But look, for me, what I'll remember about this NCAA tournament, and I'll finish with this, is redemption. Here's North Carolina that had their heart ripped out last season on a buzzer beater championship are loss really? to Villanova. And then happening? they go ahead are you, and they are beat... You? Are you giving me how great Carolina is well, right I now? Think that's is what this, I think that's what we're going to remember this championship <laughs> for, is North Carolina getting to the top, losing last year, and then finding a way to make it back and win. And, of course, now we're going to cue all the media critics going after Roy Williams, and rightfully so. North Carolina has had a lot of academic issues going over the last five or six years, so just be prepared to be lectured by Roy Williams <laughs> at some point in the next couple of days. Mike, I don't think we're cool anymore. <laughs> <laughs> But I will say that the tournament, you know, if you follow us on Facebook, if you like our Facebook page, which I think you should do, um, you would know that my thoughts is that the tournament should have been canceled after Duke lost. But um, in, the tournament dis didn't disappoint ever. There's always the Cinderella's, the bracket busters, the excellent matchups. And who would have thought that we would have a Final Four, a Sweet 16 even, without some of the real big basketball blue bloods that they're calling like the Duke, the Villanovas, uh, Kentucky went a little further, but then got bounced out. So, but the viewership didn't suffer because there were some really, really great games Absolutely. and matchups. And so I'm sad it's over looking forward to next year. And my team is going to win, I think. <laughs> so in the tournament, we saw some future NBA ballers. So let's just go with some NBA news and Draymond Green, you know, Michael, I think that he might be competing with, Who's going who's gonna to get mentioned most on the show with Johnny Menzel? Because he is just the gift that keeps on giving. In a recent matchup between the Golden State Warriors and the Houston Rockets, Warriors forward Draymond Green admittedly slapped the previously injured wrist of Houston Rockets guard James Harden. Draymond said that he did it in retaliation to James Harden pinching him during the game. Do you believe Draymond, and do you think that going forward, again, will he be a liability to his team? I don't know what to believe with Draymond Green. Uh, the guy's gotten to the point where every word out of his mouth, it just seems like, as, a, as an NBA fan, I just tune it out. There's always something with this guy. It's almost like a never-ending soap opera. He's always doing something to me that just harms other players or whatever it is. And I've gotten to the point where I'm really, really sick of this guy. As far as what Draymond Green's done, let, let's face it, he hurt this team last year in the NBA Finals when he was suspended during the, throughout that series against Cleveland, and they wound up losing the series. I think he hurts the NBA more, though, than I think that he hurts his team. Look, the Warriors, his teammates, they're all used to this. The coaching staff, they know what to expect. The fans, some of them probably enjoy this, Warrior fans specifically. But as far as NBA fans that are casual fans that tune into TNT once or twice a week to watch some of these games, Draymond Green might wind up tuning them out because these people, they're just sick and tired of this guy's act. And it's gotten to the point where it's just insufferable. And you don't want to listen or pay attention to the guy anymore because everything that he does is controversial. Yeah, when I heard this story, I thought of the Jay-Z lyric, <laughs> we don't believe you, you need more people. I just don't believe in, and, and maybe James Harden did pitch him, but the thing is, is that I've never heard of James Harden being a dirty player. And I just find it hard to believe that a grown man's going to go around pinching his opponents. So I just, I just think that Draymond is, I mean, the one thing that's great about him is his, weakness it's, it's his vulnerability and that's his competitiveness he is super competitive every time he steps on the floor he gives it a hundred percent and as a teammate and as a coach that's what you want 
from him but it it crosses the line and you he's already you know at one point he was at 10 technical fouls you get 16 then you're out for one game and then in the playoffs when you get seven you're out for one game so in a playoff series he could cost himself and his team a victory Welcome back to What's the 411 Sports. Mike, you've got some news. That's right. Former NBA player and Hall of Famer Scottie Pippen of the famed 1990 Chicago Bulls raised a bunch of eyebrows last week when he called out Phil Jackson, his old Chicago Bulls coach and now president of the New York Knicks. Pippen says that Jackson is the reason for the Knicks' current situation. Keisha, what's your take? Well, thank you, Scottie Pippen, for being vocal and lending some credibility to what us people in the New York tri-state area have been screaming about since, I don't know, this season, the previous one, is that Phil Jackson is just really not doing the job that we expected him to do and what a person in his position would do. He is making more than most people in his same position and seems to be doing less and a worse job. I think I can make better basketball decisions and I'm not an 11 time (laughs) champion. I am not a savant when it comes to basketball and I think that I can make better choices. Part of his job, his main job, is to get to a roster together that is competitive and that can get to the playoffs, if not a ring. He has not done it. He has alienated his star in Carmelo Anthony. He wants to be a semi-coach in that he's dictating to his head coach what the offense should be. He's taking over and running clinics and doing things that he shouldn't be doing. And then we talked about March Madness earlier, and one site that was really, really obvious and made it very... um, aware of what the difference in how um, people approach their roles was that Magic Johnson was present during the NCAA tournament. And that's where a lot of NBA people go to get to start scouting because the draft is coming up soon. While Magic was there, Phil was in LA, sitting next to Jeannie Buzz, I think, for the unveiling of Shaquille O'Neal's statue outside of the Staples Center. Now, which is more important? Now, in one of the reasons why he didn't want to coach is because he couldn't travel very much. So you can travel to LA to look at a statue, but you can't go to Phoenix, which is a shorter flight, and scout, which is part of your job. So I thank you, Scotty Pippen, for speaking up for all of us sufferers over here. Yeah, well, I think there's a part here where Nick fans are trying to have their cake and eat it too because Nick fans are all, all want to throw Phil Jackson under the bus and I'm one of them. I'll put myself in that category. However, you know, all Nick fans, at least the majority of them, were very excited coming into this season when the Knicks got Joaquin Noah, they got Derrick Rose, they were only able to get Courtney Lee. So it's not as if Nick fans were lukewarm or on the fence heading into 2016-17. There was a lot of excitement in this building, in the Garden, when they started this season off. Now, granted, Phil Jackson has made a lot, a lot of mistakes while coaching the Knicks. He shouldn't have gone after Derrick Rose because that move blew, has blown up in his face, and he really shouldn't. He should have let Carmelo Anthony walk two years ago to Chicago, but this isn't all Phil Jackson's fault. A lot of this starts at the top. James Dolan has been a horrible owner, and a lot of this has been what's transpired with the Knicks for the last 15, 20 years since James Dolan has been leading this team. On top of that, I think where Phil Jackson really screwed up was by bringing Derek Fisher in. I think that what happened with the Knicks, I mean, how much would you give to have Mike Woodson being back in there as their head coach right now? Who look at, let's face it, Woodson was a terrific coach for this team. They never should have let him go. And in all reality, they really, Keisha, never should have brought Phil Jackson in because this has just been not a good move for them. Welcome back to What's the 411 Sports. It's hot seat time. You ready, Keisha? Ooh, it's getting hot in her. Woo-hoo, let's go. <laughs> Will Lonzo Ball play in the NBA if he is not chosen by the L.A. Lakers in this year's NBA draft? Indeed he will. He made it very clear that his intention was to play at UCLA for one year and then declare for the draft. And he has no choice of, you know, who picks him, so he'll get there. And besides, the money is here. All right, well, my next question is, is Colin Kaepernick being blackballed? Yes, he is, but he's getting, the owners are getting bailed out by his poor performance over the past few years. Look, if Colin Kaepernick was 
playing at the level of a Drew Brees or a, a Tom Brady and wasn't getting um, picked up, then we could definitely say he's being blackballed because of his protest being thought of as a distraction. But the owners get to point to his poor play and say, no, it's because he's he's not playing well. That's why I don't like him, even though it's probably because they don't want to deal with the distraction. I completely agree <laughs> with you on that. Wow, that was, I made it. Yeah, it was it was. It was smooth and easy, I guess. And I didn't sweat. I didn't sweat <laughs> in my clothes. Yeah. <laughs> cool under pressure. Well, don't go away, because when we come back, we're coming back with our New York Sports Report. Major League Baseball kicked off their 117th season on April 2nd. Will the Chicago Cubs repeat as World Series champions? Or perhaps will another team rise from the dirt? I reached out to some MLB fans to get their input on the season. I think it's going to be a really fun season to watch. I think there's a lot of good young teams out there. We've seen baseball move from this kind of game that's filled with veterans and guys we've heard of to now it's a game where guys can come out of nowhere from all these different countries from Latin America to Asia. The international influence in baseball is going to be huge this season. Well, I think it's just going to be another great season. Uh, hopefully some of these younger guys who we've all been seeing uh, get better and really break through over the past few years, really start to come into their own and have some dominant MVP caliber seasons. We've already seen it from Chris Bryant, but hopefully guys like Carlos Correa, guys like Noah Syndergaard can really make his mark in terms of the uh, the pitchers. But other than that, I really just hope for the young guys to really come into their own this year all across baseball. I do not think the Cubs will repeat. I think that um, it was a very fun thing to watch last year, the Cubs winning. Uh, it was a hundred and some odd years. Uh, it definitely needed to be done. But um, I think the Mets are really, you know, last year they had all that hype around them, but I, I really think that the Mets have something to prove this year and they're going to come out fired up. I think that the Washington Nationals are another team that is definitely going to give the Cubs a run for their money. And I, it's very hard to win the World Series once, and it's even harder to win it back to back. So if you're going to ask me if the Cubs are going to repeat, I'm going to say absolutely not. The 2017 MLB season is sure to be exciting and most definitely a home run. Welcome back to What's the 401 Sports. That was a clip from our very own Nikolai Jackson, who is a member of the What's the 401 Sports social media team. As you can see from the video, New Yorkers are excited about baseball season. Mike, in terms of the, the Yankees and the Mets, you know, they've made some moves to get themselves ready for the season. Which team do you think has a better chance of making the playoffs? Well, I'll start with the Yankees. It could be a long season in the Bronx, and the reason for that is their pitching rotation. It's not all cracked up like they want it to be. Uh, they had a tough opening day with Masahiro Tanaka. Couldn't get it done. Had a rough outing against the Tampa Bay Rays. So this could be a long season for the Yankees. And what I mean by long season is a season where it's pretty clear that they're out of the playoff picture by mid-August and before September even starts. As far as the baby bombers, I think that there's still a lot of excitement. They have an up-and-coming star in Gary Sanchez. So there are some things to be excited about for Yankee fans. But uh, when you got a packed AL East, and what I mean by that is the Blue Jays, the Orioles, and the Red Sox are all competing in the division, it could be tough for the Yankees this season. And as far as the Mets are concerned, there's no question to answer your question. No doubt to answer your question, Keisha, that the Mets have a better opportunity here to go ahead and make the playoffs. A lot of Mets fans are hoping that the Mets can get back to where they were two seasons ago in the Fall Classic where they lost to the Kansas City Royals. The big issue for the Mets, though, it's not necessarily what's in, on their roster. It's what's on the roster right down south with the Washington Nationals. Now, this is a team that's going to go ahead and compete against the Mets in the NL East. The Florida Marlins, sorry, Miami Marlins, look like they're up and coming as well. The Philadelphia Phillies have made some roster changes. So it's going to be competitive for the Mets to go ahead and compete. But with that pitching staff, this is a team that is a contender. They will be contending, and they should wind up making the playoffs, be it as they win the NL East or as a wild card team. Well, I'm just going to go with what I really know and what my natural allegiance is, thank you know, to my grandmother, rest in peace, um, is the New York Mets. You know, that's always been a sentimental favorite for me, as I mentioned. Um, and I just love their pitching. And, but the key is going to be the health of the pitching. We've got Matt Harvey coming off of his shoulder surgery. And it's been a little bit of a rocky start for him in spring training. You've got Thor Syndergaard. I like that guy. Yeah. You know, got him, you want him healthy, and Jake DeGrom with all that hair flying around, and, you know, he's getting, you know, himself ready, and then uh, Matt Wheeler, I think he was another one who was coming off an injury, so I think 
the health of the pitching staff is really going to be key for the Mets. And I feel as though if you have great pitching, you always got a chance, right? Absolutely. So let's go, Mets. Let's just get <laughs> in the playoffs. And I want the Yankees to do well, too. New York is great when our teams do great, That's right? That's true. We're going to go to the gridiron and talk about our favorite New York Giants. And New York Giants head coach Ben McAdoo raised a few eyebrows when he said that he thought there was no reason why Geno Smith cannot be the quarterback of the future. Do you think that McAdoo was trying to motivate Eli or does maybe McAdoo see something that the rest of us don't? No, I think McAdoo was trying to motivate Geno Smith. I don't think that McAdoo has any Inspir- any at all intentions to have Geno Smith as the starting quarterback of the Giants' future. Not if he was watching what's happened with the Jets over the course of the last, last uh, couple of seasons. But, you know, a lot of Giant fans were bothered by this move, and that troubled me because I think that this was a great move for the Giants to go ahead and get Geno Smith. This is a no-brainer. And the reason why I say that is because now, God forbid, anything happens to Eli Manning, you have a good backup quarterback that you can plug in and try to, you know, put him in the right spot. So, I don't think that Geno Smith will wind up being the quarterback of the Giants' future two, three, four years from now. I don't think that that's going to happen. But I think, look, what's McAdoo supposed to say here? I think that this is good <laughs> on his part. And as far as Geno Smith, Giant fans shouldn't be concerned. There will be no quarterback controversy whatsoever. Knock on wood, Eli Manning has been very stable in the course of his time at the helm for the New York Giants. Yeah, I don't think the signing of Geno Smith is – the kind of quarterback that would give Eli any reason to worry about job security because Geno Smith just isn't there. But I like it as a as a backup because let's be clear, Ryan Nassib, come on. I think Geno Smith <laughs> is better than him and he has, for better or worse, some tried and true NFL starting quarterback experience. And if nothing else, if Eli, God forbid, is injured, you can put Geno in and Geno is mobile which is a dimension that Eli does not have. And that's going to add, you know, something to the offense, obviously, but also keep defenses from being too predictable in how they defend against, you know, the Giants offense. So it's not a bad thing. You got him for, what, a couple million dollars? Absolutely. And it might be better off for Geno Smith in the in the long run. He's with a stable organization. He's got a stable quarterback, a proven championship winner two times over MVP Super Bowl MVP two times over and Eli Manning and Eli is the consummate professional and if he if Geno Smith can learn anything from Eli in terms of being professional on and off the field it's going to be better for Geno Smith and maybe the Giants if they decide to keep him in the future absolutely well we're going to go back to the hardwood here Keisha earlier in the program we buried the New York Knicks but There's been a resurgence here in Brooklyn with the Nets. They've been showing some promise as of late. At this point, after a very good march, what's going forward? What what do you expect for the Nets as they move forward, Keisha? Well, they've built such a great camaraderie and chemistry amongst themselves, and I think that is a that's a really positive thing and something that may be overlooked because you don't see it in the stats and the box scores, but. When you're a a struggling team, there are two ways to go. You can either go for self, pad your own stats, and and hope that maybe another team will take interest in you, or you point fingers fingers at each other, and this one's to blame and that one's to blame, or you band together and you fight together. And I think that's what the Nets have done. You know, they have been overmatched in um, some contests, but the one thing about them is that they've always fought and they've always had this this idea it's it's us against everybody else you know if we're going to go down we're going to go down together and i think when you build that kind of chemistry you get to know each other you can know what how to motivate the other person how to have an honest conversation and say hey saw this in the game noticed this do you want to practice this and i think that it's a testament to Kenny Atkinson to the culture that he's established and and he's a first year coach head coach in in the league and he's acknowledged that he's got things to learn that he's learning on the job and when the season's over he's going to sit back and reflect and talk to people who are established coaches and and pick their brains a little bit so I think that we'll see more of this chemistry and I think especially I think Brooke Lopez was really instrumental and and Maybe I'm playing a little bit of favorites because I just, just something about him I genuinely like. But I feel as though 
you know, the best thing that the Nets did was to keep him because there were trade rumors surrounding Brooke Lopez. But I think one of the best things they did was to keep him not only because of his scoring production, but just being the anchor and, and that veteran and really seem, seeming to be the glue on the team. I think Brooke Lopez is one of the most underappreciated athletes in professional sports. And the reason why I say that is this guy has lost a lot of basketball games over the course of the last couple of years. And when you see him in the interviews, you see him on the court, he still has this upbeat personality about him. Not a lot of stars. And, I'll, and, I, and I'm going out on a limb calling him a star. I do consider him a star. I think he's the face of this franchise. He's done a terrific job. He's played a huge part of this transition of them coming from New Jersey to Barclays Center. And of course, moving to Industry City with their practice facilities. He is the face of this franchise. No question about it. And I think when you have a, a, a player like that who can stay upbeat, I'm sure he's been very vocal and helping out some of the younger talent that they have on that team. I'm sure that he's been very helpful for Kenny Atkinson, who's done a very good job here in his first season as the head coach, as you just pointed out. I think that there's some good things on the horizon for the Nets. It's going to take some time, and I think that, you know, as we said earlier, uh, we were talking off-air about how the Knicks, they show their fans will show up and support their team even during the tough times. You go to Barclays Center, now it's not the Garden, I understand that, but there are still people showing up to these games, yeah. even though that the Nets are struggling, they're losing, and of course, you know, you get Allie Love during the timeout, yeah. she's able to get the fans riled up and everything. And, and the dancers, the dancers. And, are... Right, so it's it's exciting, there's some down, excitement. I want to get down from my perch and be like... <laughs> Get it, get in on Absolutely. the action. It's an experience, but I don't even mean to interrupt you. No, not at all. I was just going to finish by saying again, and, and, and what, what I was talking about is Brooke Lopez. I think you pointed out. Thank God they didn't trade this guy because if they did, maybe they'd have five less wins than they have right now. And this was a good march for them. It really was. They went out. They competed. They beat some playoff teams. Who, of course, some of them might have been resting players. Some of them might have been struggling. But they've had some good wins of late. Yeah, really good stuff to carry forward. So we're looking forward to the positive future that we see for our Brooklyn Nets. Welcome back to What's the Four Women Sports. As you know, almost every week we put people who are behaving badly on the bench. And if they're really misbehaving, they get in that doghouse. Mike, you're up. I got some sad news out of Happy Valley, Keisha. This week, I'm putting Albert L. Lord, a Penn State University trustee, in the doghouse. Lord made some highly insensitive remarks regarding the victims last week of Jerry Sangusti. His quote is as follows. Running out of sympathy for 35-year-old so-called victims with seven-digit net worth, Lord wrote, do not understand why they were so prominent in, tri in trial. As you learned, Grant... Spanier never knew Sandusky abused anyone. Lord's comments are very disturbing, and he needs to face the consequences immediately and, of course, issue an apology, Keisha. For me, this was very disturbing. The average text takes your eyes off the road for nearly five seconds. At highway speeds, that's enough time to travel the length of a football field. Stop the texts. Stop the wrecks. Well, Mike, I'm sad because we have reached the point in the show where we have to say goodbye to all our friends. But don't worry, you can keep up with us until we meet again next week by liking us on Facebook, following us on Twitter and Instagram, and subscribing to our YouTube channel, All at 4 on one Sports TV. I'm Keisha Wilson, and on behalf of Mike McDonald, I'd like to thank you for joining us this week, and we look forward to checking you out again next week. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah.